Hey there, and welcome to The Jeffrey Van Dyke Show, a podcast for paradigm changers. Each week, I speak with another influential leader who's changing the conversation for their audience, their industry, and this world. I am so glad you're here. Welcome to the show. Welcome, everyone. I am so glad you're here. And uh, today, we've got a little bit different style of show. Uh, We're going to have part conversation and part masterclass with somebody who's really an expert in likability, power, influence. Uh, His name is Stephen Goldstein. Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Let me just share a little bit about you. Uh, So Stephen's a civil rights leader. He's worked in politics, business, government. Uh, he breaks down the industry of, credi- uh, of creating likability and how public figures manufacture likability and how they sometimes destroy it with scandals. Uh, he's got degrees from Harvard in public policy, Columbia in law and journalism. He's been a mover and shaker in every industry from his work as a Emmy Award winning television producer, congressional lawyer, uh, leader in state and national civil rights organizations, communications advisor to corporate and political leaders, and his latest book about likability is called The Turn On, How the Powerful Make Us Like Them from Washington to Wall Street to Hollywood. It's based on his 25 years of experience and original teachings uh, with studying why certain people are liked and others not so much in business, politics, and entertainment. So, uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Jeffrey, it's wonderful to be here. I'm thrilled. Uh, You know, one of the reasons I was particularly interested in having you is, well, two reasons. One, you're one of these multidisciplinary people that pulls from a wide variety of aspects in the world, right? I know you used to work at Oprah, Uh, As a producer, you've worked as a congressional lawyer, you have run nonprofits, been on the forefront of civil rights work, you're now in rabbinical school. Uh, So uh, I think so often the people that innovate and have new perspectives to show us are folks that live in multiple worlds. Uh, and can can pull from multiple worlds and say, hey, you know what? <laughs> you know what's consistent among these? You know what these people see that these don't? To create something new that we can teach folks. And it sounds very much like that's part of what you did with this book about turn on and likability. Is that right? Yes, the key in any profession that faces the public is, do you have the skills to motivate the public to get off its collective butt? to help you create change. Mm -hmm. And for me, who is interested in everything, it's a blessing and a curse. I made a promise to myself that I would be a a lawyer, a television producer, a congressional staffer, an author, and become a rabbi, all when I grew up. Uh, Wait, wait a minute. You made a promise to yourself to do all of those things. I really did, Jeffrey, and I think my parents thought I was Meshuga to use the Yiddish expression. Yeah. The thing I wanted to be most, though, was a rabbi out of all those things. And I told my parents when I was seven, in the back of their Chevrolet Impala, I said, they said, what do you want to be? And I said, all the things I told you, I was the most precocious little kid. I played hooky at age six to work for Hubert Humphrey instead of going to school. So I wanted, I was very aware I wanted to do all these things, but I wanted to be a rabbi most. And um, like any Jewish parents, when a child says, we want to become a rabbi, the parents say, what kind of profession is that? Right. Be a doctor or a lawyer. It was uh, like a curb your enthusiasm routine, yeah. if you will. Yeah. I never gave up on that dream. I'm an uh, activist in the LGBT community, among other things. And when I was growing up, uh, openly LGBTQ people couldn't be rabbis. Um, That changed um, not so long later, actually. And so I put this dream of mine in the back of my head. And in my 50s, I decided to go to rabbinical school. And uh, it was a hard decision in that I had to pretty much leave the height of my career. Rabbinical school is very intense. Yeah. Uh, But I, I don't have regrets. So I'm very you happy. know, one of the things that's consistent for everybody that I serve is 
you know, routinely in every every situation, I'm going along in life. Life is going well, uh, and then something calls you to something new. W- was this? Was this just, oh, this is the time? Was it a, a deeper kind of spiritual calling to do this? How did you discern and know and, 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 and have the chutzpah to go, all right, it's time, let's go? Well, uh, like you mentioned, I thought I always had this philosophy. If it's not broken, fix it. Um, to say that, um, you know, I'm gliding on a smooth path and very comfortable, that never really appealed to me. In every job I've had, Jeffrey, I've wanted to achieve a goal. When I founded and ran New Jersey Civil Rights Organization, I wanted to win marriage equality. When I was a congressional staffer, I wanted to write certain bills into law, and I did. When I was a television producer, I wanted to produce certain stories in the public interest, and I did. I don't think I ever held a job because of the money or the title. The influence mattered, influence to do well. I woke up one day in my 50s and I said, you know, Stephen, you have achieved a lot of your dreams. You've had a really blessed life. Mm -hmm. But there's the one dream that you haven't achieved and that which you wanted to be since a little kid. I didn't grow up religious and it's hard to explain what it means to be a progressive, observant Jewish person. In other words, I'm not Barbara Streisand in Yentl. I do not wear a black hat and black coat. I'm a lefty gay activist who's in rabbinical school. And that means that I observe very progressively. Um, I'm becoming more and more observant, but um, a typical weekend for me would be to light Shabbat candles on a Friday night and then go protest something. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much my world. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, religion offered me a respite when I was a child from a pretty difficult childhood I would say and I felt when I went to synagogue that I was part of something bigger I luxuriated in being a speck in a bigger community that embraced me just a speck but a vital speck and it never left me Um, And I guess you could say I rebelled a bit. Uh, My parents, we were all proud of our our religion, but they're not religious whatsoever. And I think it's what kept me going in many ways. Uh, And I am guided by a belief in God. And this, all this may sound really funny to your audience. What is a liberal, openly gay activists like me doing, talking about religion. Even as I hear these words, I, I'm, for people who wouldn't know, I must sound like a, some born-again right-winger. The truth is, a lot of the civil and human rights activists in history have been clergy and people of faith. Mm-hmm. So this is not unusual to me. And my rabbinical school has people of every ideology, but it's mostly progressive. And Over the years, um, my activism or the other work I've done was guided by this belief in God. Now, I'm agnostic as to whether God is a higher power upstairs, which we call supernatural power. So my definition of God is that God is this inner strength, this inner power within each of us to make sense of the world and to move the world forward. It's this inner strength. And that's a kind of God that I can relate to. I'm not saying that I I reject that God is a supernatural power. I'm open. I'm agnostic. I'm not atheist in any sense. But for me, God is that inner power. And to fight for social justice, you have to be a person of faith, even if you're not religious, um, because faith is believing as Martin Luther King says, said that you can climb the whole staircase without seeing the steps. To be a social justice activist, you have to believe on blind faith that you can change the world without seeing the future right in front of you. You just have to believe. So even my most 
a religious friends I think are people of faith. I love that definition. <laughs> you know, uh, as I was preparing for this conversation, one of the questions that came to mind is, you've obviously worked in the halls of power most of your life, right? Uh, and, and, and wrote this book about likability, and, which is ultimately about power and influence in, in many ways. And I, it got me to thinking, well, what's that got to do with spirituality? And I think you just answered that question uh, with your definition of God and relationship to activism. I never give up hope, Jeffrey. I have been in some of the darkest places in activism. I fought for marriage equality many years ago, where in a liberal state like New Jersey, I was spit at, and kicked, and called names you wouldn't even want to know. And uh, this happened every day. And I just believed, I had faith that the world would change my way. And 20 years later, it did. Uh, and um, I can find hope in anything. Yeah. Uh, where do you think that comes from? So I'd have to tell you a bit about me personally, as far as how I was shaped. And the person who shaped me most of all was my brother and is my brother. Now, my brother has profound autism. Um, he has an IQ of about 35 when it was last measured. I mean, I hate to use IQ as a standard of intelligence, but that's just to get it across to your audience. And he's two years, two and a half years younger than me. I'll be 60 years old in June, which is driving me crazy. <laughs> and he, and um, he, he's 57 and a half. I digress. When I was growing up, 60 was old. And today it's not. I mean, you know, the Beatles sang when I'm 64. My God. So, uh, so I grew up with a very severely disabled brother. And, you know, Jeffrey, I toilet trained him uh, along with my parents. But I always played a, a guardian-like role. And it forced me to grow up very fast. Perhaps the only negative is I don't think that I had as much of a childhood as perhaps I should. I was always worrying about my brother. And I saw the discrimination against him. And I saw what government did to him in treating him unequally. And it didn't make me cynical about government. It didn't make me conservative it made me want to change government and government policy. I believe that government could be a force for good in the world. And over the years, uh, I've seen my brother be a miracle. Uh, he, he has come such a long way. Hmm. And I have seen the human capacity for growth. I think there's a double-edged sword to this. <laughs> You know, um, I digress. I'm somebody who believes that I can impact anybody and that every human being has, also has the capacity for growth. You know, I've been on and off single for the last uh, seven years after a 23-year relationship with my ex-husband. And I, it's hard in the dating world because even if somebody is terribly inappropriate for me, <laughs> Somehow in my, in, in my head they become a project. And um, my friends tell me, and I'm just be honest, my friends tell me, Stephen, you can't, this is, you're not fighting for a woman's right to choose. You're not fighting for marriage equality. You're not fighting gun violence. What are you talking about? This person is so wrong for you. And um, I've dated a couple of those. And, uh, <laughs> and in fact, I'm almost... Lord by it. I'm lured by people who are not actually not like me, people from who are just different. So it is a double edged sword, by the way, yeah. to 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 think that anybody is capable of change 
and um, that you can help change them. First of all, I know that there's ego involved in that. And uh, I always say, look, if there's ego, let it be for a good cause as opposed to being for power for power's sake. And I think to be a social justice activist, you better have a little bit of ego to think that you can create change. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you, you my know, brother I, I, gives me hope. I love that you share that, Stephen. And one of the things I, I, I see for folks on a journey of like, I'm here to be a change agent in the world. Invariably, there's something in our history that sent us on our path that was part of our training, part of our development, part of our growth. Um, and I do see this switch when we move from the training program for, to the purpose delivery uh, and that discernment of who needs my gifts and where do they belong and, and, and how do I share them. Uh, you know, I, I remember listening to a, a colleague of mine recently who does all this work around purpose. Uh, and helping them find their way, right? And she was like, for the longest time, I dated lost souls, and I helped them find their way, and then they would break up with me, uh, right? And uh, <laughs> till finally I realized for a romantic relationship, I needed to uh, date someone who actually knew their purpose already. So um, I, 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 I really appreciate you sharing that, and I don't <laughs> think you're the only one who's ever had that experience. Yeah, well, I, uh, you yeah. know... Right. With people with my personality, if they're honest with you, they will tell you a very similar story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, that, I, 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 uh, I resemble those remarks until my <laughs> current partner. <laughs> um, let me ask you a little bit about the book. So first of all, why? Why write this book? Yeah, you know, Jeffrey, so I should tell the audience a bit about the book and how I came to write a book about likability. So I remember many years ago in um, the early 90s, I was a lawyer for the House Judiciary Committee. And I was a staffer who worked on and helped write laws like the Brady Law Against Gun Violence and the Violence Against Women Act and an uh, abortion clinic entrance freedom act to uh, stop anti-choice protesters. And uh, I took part in a series of some very major laws there, and it was a very rewarding thing. And I also put hearings together, uh, which was a good skill set for me. I had gone to journalism school, and putting hearings together meant that I would find witnesses that were like, well, TV guests. Hmm. And I started to oh, take oh, notes. Hold on. Is yes. this before or after being at Oprah? Just before. Okay. Just before I was a lawyer on the House Judiciary Committee. And I started to take notes about what makes uh, a compelling witness. By the way, I, I, I digress. I was a, already a producer at the ABC station in Washington. So I have, I've gone back and forth between television and uh, public policy, at least at that stage of my career. So here I was taking notes about what made certain witnesses effective and actually what made them likable. And I came up with about 25 traits. Okay, in the oddest career change you could ever imagine, I ended my tenure as a lawyer for the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Criminal Justice, which was chaired by then House member Chuck Schumer, uh, and I left that job on a Friday. And the following Monday, I was a producer for The Oprah Winfrey Show. And it, even I said to myself at the time, you know, this is pretty head spinning. It's the left brain, right brain thing. And I'm sure, as with your other guests, part of my internal struggle in life, listen, I'm a neurotic Jewish guy, so I struggle about everything. I'm like the gay Larry David. But part of my struggle in life is, how do I fulfill the left brain when, the right, when I'm working in a right brain function? And how do I fill the right brain when I'm working in a left brain job? And I always say this, I absolutely know a lot of people who are smarter than me. I completely defer to them. I've been very lucky 
to work with some of the smartest people in the country. How do I put this in a way that doesn't sound awful? There are a few people who have that left brain, right brain capacity. Like, um, I, I can do something intensely intellectual, like write legislation, a thousand pieces, a thousand pages of legislation, and every legalistic word. You want that from me, you can get that. But boy, do I love being in a TV editing room and looking at tape. And it's a completely different part of the brain. And I loved being a TV producer. I didn't think it was as intellectual as I wanted, so I said, okay, I'm going to actually use my law degree now. So anyway, I made this job transition from Congress to being a producer for Oprah. And I started to take notes when I was at Oprah as to what made talk show guests likable. Now, in Congress, my goal was to find likable witnesses who would influence members of Congress to vote a certain way. And at Oprah, frankly, it was for ratings. Yeah. But they had something in common. They were both to effectuate change. And by the way, the reason that I wanted to be a producer at a talk show, especially hers, was just the platform that that afforded. Um, I had no particular background in talk shows. Um, I th think most of them are inane, but Oprah had a higher purpose. And um, that's what appealed to me. So I started to take notes at Oprah, like I did in Congress, and guess what? I came up with the same 25 or so traits of what made people likable. And I decided, and I, I took notes in different jobs throughout my career about people I met. And I decided to write this book based on the premise that likability is necessary to affect change in the public interest. What I didn't feel like doing was writing uh, a National Enquirer book. I'm not writing about, I, I listen, I, I write about 300 celebrities in this book. Anybody who wants to see bold face names and a juicy read, thinks they're gonna read People Magazine, you'll find it, it's that. But I wanted a much higher purpose too. Like, how are these people impacting us in American society whom we find likable. Uh, likability is the currency of change in America. Hold on. We'll just say that one again. Likability is the currency of change. Yes. Yeah. Likability is the currency of change. Say more about that piece. You know, okay. It's hard to believe that I'm about to say this, but in 2016, when Donald Trump ran for president, I want to caution your audience again. I am a progressive Democrat. As far as I'm concerned, Donald Tr Trump is the scum of the earth, always has been, and I've always said it, right? But I understood his likability in 2016 in that race to a constituency, not to me. Uh, I, my goal in writing this book is what appeals to the average American. Otherwise, I'd be writing a book about the Golden Girls. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's what it feels to me. <laughs> God bless her soul, Betty White. Yeah, I, right? I, I, I know. I say that in jest, by the way. So uh, I, I try to look at things through the prism of, of, the, of, of everyday Americans. And I understood Donald Trump's appeal. I found him repulsive, but I understood his appeal in that he was this populist who claimed to speak for people the, he tapped into people's anger, people who weren't being heard. And I remember I was teaching a class at the time in political campaigns. And I remember telling my class very early on in the presidential race that Donald Trump was absolutely going to be the Republican nominee uh, a moment before any primary occurred. And I understood to his party why he's likable. Do I understand so much today? Not so much today. I mean, he just keeps going downhill every single day. But to his party, I understood that. I would also tell you that I think President Biden, whom I support, 
who is an eminently likable person, is now having likability issues of his own that, is a, that are affecting his popularity and that are in turn affecting his ability to get his legislative agenda through. Mm-hmm. And uh, whether I find him likable or not, and I do, that's not the point. It's what is it about him that is not inspiring Americans to like him? Because he has some really great achievements, but he's not that liked for them. Hold on. That's a problem that, that I can explain. That piece, right, uh, you can do a lot. And this is one thing I've noticed with Biden in this particular in his presidency is uh, we don't hear about the great things he's done. They're not doing a great job of talking about them, but also not being liked for them is the piece you're bringing in. Say, share just a bit more about that, and then let's go into you know, how you've distilled this into you know, traits that we can... You know, you, well, I'll go into that in a minute. You know, let's go back to Ronald Reagan, Jeffrey. Uh, I was certainly no fan of Reagan's I think he's responsible for the deaths of many people who had AIDS in his early years by not recognizing it early enough, not funding AIDS research and prevention early enough. So I I can't forgive him that. But let's go to the fact that he was a great communicator. Uh, People forget that before the economy started roaring in 1984, timed for his reelection, we were in one of the worst recessions in decades, back in in 82. And it was his personality that got him through those days. He was able to float on a likability life raft, even though his policies, frankly, in my view, were killing the country and the economy was a mess and he kept on promising stay the course. People believed him. Barack Obama had a likability life raft. You know, by uh, 2012, when Obama ran for re-election, he had started to turn around the economy. But it was still not in great shape. Obama, by his 2012 re-election campaign, had rescued the economy from a... a great recession, practically a depression to an eh economy. It's lukewarm. And uh, I'm the campaign theme of I gave you a lukewarm economy is not usually a winner. <laughs> um, but Obama had a personality that made people believe in him. And that was his likability life raft. And I fear that President Biden doesn't have that. Now, I'm a supporter of his. Uh, uh, I, I want him to succeed. I believe in his agenda. As a progressive person, I'm thrilled with his agenda, in fact. Uh, but he's not coming across as he should. I, I should tell you, it feels like, he. first of all, he's not out there that much. It feels like a hidden president. He, he, and he feels almost like uh, George H.W. Bush. The first George Bush was also um, somebody who wasn't out there a lot, but Biden even less. And he, he's, he's floating at sea despite a whole ship of achievements. He's floating adrift. So, and it's a problem, and it kills me, by the way, yeah, as a Democrat. Yeah. So what, like, break down what are the elements of likability as you see them? Yeah, so uh, I broke down likability into four different stages. Each stage, one after the other, having two likability traits that were closely tied, symbiotic. And let's go to stage one. The first stage is, um, is this person captivating? Now, when I was writing my book, I actually called, is this captivation, is the first trait. 
I actually said, is this person entertaining? And I changed it to captivation. My notes from 25 years say entertaining. I changed it to captivation because I was afraid some people would think that politicians and CEOs and people from all walks of life have to sing like Adele or, or dance like, uh, like, like Beyonce. But no, um, public figures have to be compelling in the sense that they have to draw attention to uh, um, us instantly, hmm. especially in the age of social media. You have about a minute not to be boring. One minute. I think Steven Spielberg said, and I quote this in my book actually, was it 15 minutes or 18 minutes? I think he said you have 15 minutes to capture the audience or they're gone. And so if you're not entertaining to people, you will have no opportunity to show the rest of your likability traits because they're not even going to pay attention. Hmm. So that's the, the way, foundation. And th th yeah, and I think that's the problem with Biden. By the way, he's not entertaining. And people, he's not, I call it captivating, but it is entertainment. And people might scoff at that. But that is what Americans wanted. And yes, Americans had enough and they were burnt out from Donald Trump. And they wanted a transition. I don't think they wanted a transition from a program that wore them out to a program that they could fall asleep on. Uh -huh. Or just wasn't on air. Ju right. Yeah. Just wasn't on air at all, Jeffrey. Yeah. Exactly. So along with captivation comes the second trait of hope. Hope is to be uplifting, to give people hope that you can improve their lives, to be a positive force in the world, to be captivating without hope is to be Amorosa, uh, you know, a reality show villain. And if, if you don't give people hope, if you're not a compelling, upbeat force for good, for change, uh, you will soon be rejected. And, and Donald Trump in 2016, to his base, he gave them hope, right? Right. Um, his presidency killed that. So captivation and hope are the first two traits. And, and, and to, be, to be clear, you can be captivating in many, many different ways. It doesn't have to be you know, being funny. Uh, or... Yeah, it doesn't at all. And, I, and my book is very instructive, though it's not a how-to book. It could easily be one. Because I talk about all the different ways that you could be captivating. And I even talk about ways that you could be captivating even if you're boring. Now, one of the most unlikable people, and at one time a pretty boring guy, but he had this trick of being both somewhat boring and somewhat abrasive, was Richard Nixon, one of the most unlikable people. And um, he ran for president in 1960, and then he ran for governor of California in 1962. He lost both races. He hired a likability coach. He hired a producer from the Jack Parr show to train him how to be likable. He knew he had a personality problem. Richard Nixon has known his whole life, had known that he was unlikable. So he learned to play the piano. And he started appearing on talk shows playing piano long before Arsenio Hall played the saxophone. Uh, but Bill Clinton played the saxophone with Ar Arsenio Hall long before politicians showed up on The View. Richard Nixon was playing piano, and he was captivating people. In that case, it actually was entertainment. And Richard Nixon's crowning achievement on likability, how he transformed himself, was to appear on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In a couple of weeks before the 68 election where he said the tagline, sock it to me. Hubert Humphrey was invited to the same show. Hubert Humphrey, one of the most likable people ever to run for office. Hubert Humphrey thought appearing on that show and saying that line was beneath the dignity of a president and a presidential campaign. He chose not to, and then Hubert Humphrey attributed his very narrow loss to not appearing on Laughing. Hmm. So there you go. Now, Richard Nixon could have done a lot of things to be compelling, um, like smile. Uh, <laughs> you know, he was, a pretty, 
he was a pretty dour guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think he had to go all the way to playing the piano. Yeah. But um, that, I wanted to give that example because I also say in my book, Jeffrey, that likability can be somewhat manufactured, somewhat, that I argue that you can take a trait that somebody has, a likability trait, and bring it more to the surface, emphasize it more. You can't make an unperson, an unlikable person, likable or it won't be permanent. In Richard Nixon's case, he had a, a, a moment of likability. It, it was for him an anachronism because then he was elected president and he was himself again. So, but I do argue to some extent likability can be manufactured. Mm -hmm. So we've got captivation and hope. And once we are captivating people and we're bringing them some hope, where do we go from there? The next two traits are authenticity and relatability. And let me say this to everybody watching and listening. If you ever hear a political pundit on uh, cable or wherever say the American people crave authenticity, turn the channel because that commentator, that talking head, doesn't have a clue as to what he or she or they are talking about. You know, it's one thing to be authentic and it's another thing to appear authentic. And in my book, <laughs> I call it, in my book, I call it faux authenticity. You know, television is largely the medium that everybody communicates in along with social media. How could anybody be authentic in 280 characters or less? And how could anybody be authentic when you have to speak in sound bites? It's impossible. You have to craft your presentation of yourself. Americans don't want an authentic person who doesn't speak in sound bites, who doesn't know what a quote is, who can't write 280 characters on Twitter. Americans don't want an authentic person who's in a bad mood or who, who is just boring as could be. No, Americans want a public version of authenticity. <laughs> so I, I find a public authenticity, I also call it faux authenticity, which sounds so oxymoronic, um, as a, a crafted form of yourself. Yeah. And uh, relatability explains itself. I mean, people want somebody they can't relate to. Right. So, and I talk in depth in the book about the confluence of those traits. So if you feel true to us, you feel natural, you feel like you're comfortable in your own skin, uh, even though you might not show us all different sides of yourself, including the time when you're mad as hell or depressed and want to stay in bed, that public facing version of authenticity Plus, oh, I can connect with you on some level. There's some relatability to you. That is that, uh, that piece of authenticity and relatability. Exactly right. Could you imagine being a guest on a TV show and just, you had a bad day. You had a fight with your partner or your spouse. You have indigestion from a meal. Um, you didn't get a good night's sleep. Could you imagine going on The Tonight Show and having Jimmy Fallon ask you, so how are you doing? And the person says, I didn't have a good night's sleep and I was stuck on the A train coming here. That's not what America wants to hear. So I, you I, can't be authentic that much. And, and, you know, for the folks that I typically serve, authenticity is a really big deal. And, you know, priding yourself on being true to yourself and being true to your work in the world. But I would even argue for those people creating change, if people don't want to listen to you, if they want to churn the proverbial channel, whether it's on social media or somewhere else, uh, you can't get to connection, relatability, and, and where we might go to move people if they don't want to listen to you. So, right. you know, like, and I do think there's something about being, uh, like, let's say someone's advocating for mental health awareness and they're being authentic about when they're having a, a bout of depression and sharing about that. Uh, you know, uh, one of my teachers used to say, never tell a story while you're still bleeding from it. 
In other exactly words, right. uh, learn the lesson from the thing and then teach from the lesson. Uh, you know, Jeffrey, when I, when I, when I teach um, communication for social justice advocacy, I always, you're 100% right, I always tell people, you can't tell your sob story or that of somebody else without an uplifting ending. What lessons, how can this inspire you, how can you learn from this? If you don't include that high note, you'll be rejected as a pill. So most people, to be authentic, they tell their stories. They don't naturally think of, well, what lessons are there for the world? That's right. a bit crafted, but you got to do it. Got to do it. So, you know, my work is packaging paradigm changers work so it can be delivered. And you've, you've got to make those connections for people. Um, so we've got captivation and hope, authenticity and relatability. Where do we go from there? Then the next two traits I call protectiveness and reliability. If you show people that you're likable, you're captivating, you're uplifting, provide people hope, you come across as reasonably authentic in the public realm and you're relatable, people want to know if you're going to be steady at it. Are they seeing you as you're always going to be? Are you going to be a reliable person? And are you going to be protective? Um, that means that the person will, will feel comfort in you, that you will have their back. Now, who is in the public sphere considered uh, protective and reliable? Morgan Freeman, for example. He, he is reliable in role after role after role, rarely, do, rarely has a dud, and he's in roles of wisdom and strength to which people look at him for, or his characters for guidance. Uh, he's somebody who uh, is both protective and reliable. Um, Betty White, oh, I wouldn't call her protective, but Betty White, listen, she spent 99.99 years being reliable. Meaning you turned on the TV and you were going to laugh before she even said a word. And uh, that is what we loved about her. Oh she God. was reliably funny. Absolutely. I, 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 uh, my, my partner's brother owns a zoo, well, a wildlife learning center and rehabilitation. And Betty was a dear friend and supporter of uh, the wildlife learning center. Um, so when she died, you know, I went, I went and looked at different clips and just watching her on... Uh, uh, certain late night shows. Uh, one, I, I don't even remember what the comment was, but she was so immediately on it, uh, you know, something about being sexy, and she uh, immediately pulled up her leg and showed a little leg, and she says, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Like, just, she was so quick to offer in, in everything she did. I, that's such a great example of reliability because she was reliably funny. So good. And you know, Jeffrey, she was reliably funny in very different roles. So it, it, she was reliably funny as Sue Ann Nivens and reliably funny as Rose Nyland. And you couldn't get two characters who were more opposite from one another. Uh, a nymphomaniac to a very naive, pure person. And... Um, that was the magic of Betty White, and she was so comfortable with herself. And even at age 100, almost, she was entertaining us. One of the most reliably funny and captivating people ever. So, and I write about her in my book. So. Protectiveness is the thing that goes along with reliability, and I, I love that. One of the things I always say is that when people are coming into your world, especially if you're doing change work, or helping them evolve as an individual or in an industry or a company. One of the questions people are always asking is, if I step into your world, can you hold me? Right? Like, uh, will you collapse? Or will you be that steady force that can hold me? Especially if people are doing change work. Change is difficult for humans. Right? So, 
Yes, you, you, you couldn't have put it better. You know, Jeffrey, I think we all have, among the eight traits, one trait that's a standout trait. I know that for me, if you were to poll a thousand people, uh, 980 might say, would, would definitely say uh, protectiveness. That I'm, I'm a very fierce fighter with others. Hmm. And uh, I will take slings and arrows for any cause and any underdog. And it's worth noting along those lines, one of the things I say in my book that likability is not the equivalent of being nice. <laughs> now, I'd like to think that I'm a very nice person. At least I've grown a lot. Uh, I am not the same person at all that I was 20 years ago. So uh, I'm a much softer, more reflective person. And in fact, I don't know that I could repeat some of my fiercest battles. I tell this to my friends and they say, put you in the wild in two seconds, you'll repeat them. And, um, but my point is this, I could have had a category that's, that says nice. Well, what does nice mean? Nice is milk toast. Nice is not polarizing. Nice is safe and nice is being liked by as many people as possible because you did nothing offensive. Which makes you absolutely dismissible. Absolutely dismissible. And I don't define that as likable. So, listen, I'm a pretty fierce guy. Um, and anybody to see me in action would see that ferocity. And they might say, okay, this guy wrote a book on likability. Well, maybe it's self-serving that I... I I frame it uh, around why it's possible for uh, fighters like me. But listen, I found Harvey Milk very likable. Oh, he was. I intensely likable. You wouldn't describe him as nice. No. I, I like to talk about the for difference me, nice between nice For me, nice is the kiss of death, by the way. Yeah. I, I like to talk about the difference between nice and kind. I love kind people. I'm completely bored by nice people. Uh, years ago, somebody tried to set me up on a date with this guy, and they said, he's so nice. I said, I don't date nice people. I'm not interested. Jeffrey, I swear to you, Jeffrey, it's the same thing. My friends keep setting me up with nice people. What are they doing? Like, so, by, by the way, I have a chapter about dating, and I describe all of these eight traits like a date, meaning um, when we go out on a date with a blind date, we, we go through the eight traits in the same order to assess whether we like them and eventually fall in love that we do with public figures, right? So, listen, if you want to talk about captivating, by the way, is the most important trait, I'm sure everybody would agree. I don't know this. What would you rather have? A date that bores you to death where there's a ton of silence and you don't know what to say and you're squirming, or the biggest jerk in the whole world with whom you're sparring? I don't know about you. I'd rather have the second. Uh, I, I, I got to tell you a story. Uh, when I met my partner, I, I'd gone on a search for what I, I... I realized I knew more about what I didn't want than what I did want in a relationship. And I'm like, okay, I know how manifestation works. I got to create a picture of what I actually want. So I started looking for couples that had something I'd want to emulate. And one couple in particular were champions for one another. And I just saw it, how they so lifted each other's dreams up and supported one another. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's the foundation I want. Uh, I, I put it as a little line in a dating profile. When I met Pete, the first time we talked, he said, hey, you said in your profile, you're looking for someone to champion you uh, that you can champion as well. He goes, I know how to champion somebody. And I will never forget I, kind of, you know, that proverbial yeah, holding yeah, the phone I, out. I, I, I would have had an orgasm right on the spot right. if somebody said that to me. <laughs> I, I just got to tell you, let's just get right to the chase. That, to me, I actually, I wouldn't care what they look like. I'm sure he's very handsome, but it wouldn't matter to me. If I heard that line, that is an aphrodisiac. Yeah, yeah. It that was. person would at least get three more dates with me. <laughs> like, oh my God. And the person's definitely going to get lucky pretty soon. Because that is good for Pete. 
<laughs> You're good for Pete. And that's the best. But you really know what protective is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had a big event I was doing. Uh, once we'd been dating for a few years, I'd moved in. We were on a walk, and I was, I was saying to him how nervous I was about it. And he just, he just stopped, and he looked at me. And he said, Jeffrey, you must do this. Right? You must. Uh, he's like, you'll either crash or burn or you'll soar. It'll probably be somewhere in between, but you must do this. And I, I said to him, how do you have as much conviction around my life's work as I do? I'd never experienced that. And he said, I'm not convicted around your life's work. I'm convicted around you and you're convicted around your life's work. Right? That was that fierce uh, protection. It, and it's also what I look for. Yeah. You know, somebody like me who's in the business of fighting for others, I kind of want somebody to do that for me. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, some of the protection uh, and likability is about intuiting somebody else's needs. You might relate to this. So, listen, I'm not a shy person. I'm an outgoing person. I hate parties, though. It's the most, nobody really understands this. I could sooner talk on a podcast or to 50,000 people at a convention, but put me at a party with, you know, if it's a party of 20, 30 other people, I am the shyest person in the world. I don't want to talk to anybody. Nobody really understands that, I know. And I, a, a, a good partner would know something weird about you that nobody else knows, something that makes no sense and wants to protect you in helping you deal with that trait, which could be a bit uh, difficult. I remember, I was just reading the other day, by the way, Johnny Carson was very, uh, very friendly, very outgoing, but when he would go to parties, he would sit in a corner and not talk to anybody. Now, here was this talk show host who just sat in the corner. From that, he got a reputation of being a loner and very difficult. Uh, he disputed that. He just says, listen, I'm actually just a very shy person in real life. And um, somebody who's protective intuits that about you and helps you deal with it. Yeah. And I think the same thing is true when you have either a political constituency or a client base or an audience you speak to, you're also protective for them and you intuit like what that audience needs from you uh, as a protector. Let's go to the, the, last, the last two. Uh, I think it's compassionate and perceptive. Is that right? Yeah, c c compassionate and perceptiveness, I call them the conscience traits. You've gone through the first six traits, so the first three pairs. You know, you want to know when you're dating somebody, not whether they're going to be nice to you or a colleague or a boss. Are they going to be nice to a server in a restaurant? Are they going to be nice to your pet? No, I'm, I'm dead serious. Are they going to be nice to people who might be at a power disadvantage? And I call it the conscience trait because I can't tell you how many people I know in dating um, are so attracted to somebody else's likability, and then they see some jerky side to the person. And it starts unraveling. I, uh, you know, there's the proverbial, how do you treat a surfer in the restaurant? Well, I actually know many relationships that fell apart because one partner couldn't stand that aspect of another partner. So um, perceptiveness I've touched a bit on, to have that intuition. Um, compassion plays a role in the public sphere. Look, let me give you an example. Angelina Jolie. I, I am not sure what, oh, to what extent. She's very involved in charities. She's very involved in causes. She's very involved in PR advertising those things. Okay. I think she does good in the world. Far, you know, if she wants publicity to do good in the world, 
God bless her. It's better than getting publicity for things that make no difference, right? I think anybody who does good in the world deserves credit, regardless of their motivations. But for her, compassion is a stock in trade. And celebrities, when they get involved in causes, Hollywood celebrities, I'm not saying that they don't really believe in their causes, but it's adding a look of compassion to them. Oh, so-and-so is such a good person. Mm. And that really seals the deal mm. for us uh, to make them likable. How, how does, so I understand that from a public perception standpoint, how does pers uh, 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 being perceptive show up publicly in terms of that being a trait? Listen, I worked for Oprah, and she was the most perceptive person I ever met. Mm. And it was her perceptiveness as to what her average viewer wanted that made her likable. I was going to say what the average woman wanted, and her audience was largely women at 4 o'clock. So I'm not being sexist. It was mostly women. Uh, and that demographics just proved that. And so she was perceptive and had uh, her finger on the pulse. Mm. Perceptiveness is about having uh, a finger on the pulse. In politics, Donald Trump was very perceptive in 2016. He was perceptive and he tapped into the anger of many Americans. And he was perceptive in se sexistly making fun of Hillary Clinton's likability. Uh, and the chapter of the book that I am most proud of is when I talk about likability double standards. The double standards that women face, that African Americans face, and that LGBTQ people face. Uh, and because I'm political, all the other chapters took weeks or months on end. I wrote that chapter in a day, and it's, it's, it came from the heart, and it just flowed because uh, it's the basis of what I do in my career. It involves social justice. And likability differs for women versus men because Americans are much tougher on women. In fact, the question of whether somebody is likable is applied to women and not even applied to men. Right. You know, um, nobody asks whether male leaders are likable. No, they view male leaders through the likability prism, but they don't actually ask, is this person likable? You don't hear right? those words but in the media. they say that about women. They say it about women all the time. I mean, is this person likable? Is Hillary likable? Look at Kamala Harris. Half the articles about her are she's not likable. And if you look at everybody who ran for president, um, Amy Klobuchar, um, her campaign... And I like her. I actually like her very much. She's a very effective senator. But her campaign got off to a very rocky start because she was deemed as unlikable, as mean to her staff. There were I these initial that. articles. By the way, I worked on Capitol Hill. I can't tell you how many bastards exist among male members of Congress and male senators. But you never hear stories. I can tell you, having worked on Capitol Hill, I can tell you the gossip much of it true, some of it not, about how difficult and unlikable every woman in, in, on Capitol Hill is as a boss, right? Because it was just talked about. The, the men were, there are some gruesome men out there, and just, it's not talked about. Men are forgiven for being gruesomely unlikable. Women are not. It's a double standard. Huge. Yeah. Where do you, uh, in preparing for this conversation, I, I watched a, a clip of you saying like that's the, the you know, that's the strongest uh, glass ceiling is in in you know for women in the relationship between men and women. Uh, yeah, you know, it's unbelievably Jeff. So I gotta tell you, the 2020 election was instructive to me on one thing. Um, you know, well, in the primaries, I, I'm from, I now live in New Jersey, just outside of New York, and I know Cory Booker. He was a friend of mine. So early on, when he was running for president, I supported him. Then I supported Mayor Pete. And I was so enthralled 
by how likable Mayor Pete not only was, but was perceived as such. I mean, people really liked this guy, right? Yeah. Now, I said, wow, I have to pinch myself. Here is an LGBTQ person, certainly not in the closet. He brought his husband all over the place, talked about raising a family, and now, now they're doing so. And he was likable. And it dawned on me, this country is far more likely to elect a gay male president than a woman. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think that, I, I can't believe I'm saying it. I, I just, um, it, it's hard to believe. Um, and, and Mayor Pete deserved all those accolades. He is likable. But he also has many of the traits that Hillary Clinton has, by the way. Mayor Pete and Hillary Clinton are both policy wonks. They're brilliant. And they could both, there's not, they're both like the Amy Schneider of public policy. There's nothing you could throw at Mayor Pete or Hillary Clinton. And if they never read a briefing book about it, they could go in depth on anything. Absolutely. To Americans, he's likable because of it. To Americans, too many Americans, she's a shrill know-it-all because of it. That's a difference in perception. Have you seen any movement there? Or where do you think, what do you think needs to happen or can happen to, to, to bridge that divide? It's the hardest question, and I don't have the answer, and it kills me. I, I thought that that answer was going to be solved in 2016. I really did. You know, by the traditional standards of public office, by the traditional standards of politics, Jeffrey, when I was growing up, the country never would have trusted a woman to control our defense, our military. By the way, if there's one doubt that people didn't have about Hillary Clinton, it's that she was tough enough. Yeah. She neutralized all the traditional concerns about a woman. Nobody thinks that Hillary Clinton is not tough enough. Nobody thought that Hillary Clinton couldn't do the job. Nobody. She didn't win because of a visceral, ugh, I just don't like her. But nobody doubted that she could do the job, right? right? And um, I don't know, and I, and I think it's going backwards. I don't know. Um, I happen to like Kamala Harris very much, but you see her likability is being attacked. And, and by the way, if you watch Fox News, which I try not to do too much of, but once in a while I turn in to see how the other side is thinking, um, they're a 24-7 Kamala Harris bash fest, and they get very personal about it. Uh, with sexist overtones, racist overtones, and it really shows, but more sexist, by the way, Men, more, much more sexist, and it just, it shows how difficult this is for women. Yeah. I wish I had an answer. And, and, and the challenging thing, I, I had a client uh, a few years ago uh, that did a lot of work around women's relationship to women in the professional workplace. And, you know, she was always saying, it, it was the women that kept me down. It was the women uh, that were most vicious to me. So there's also can be that internalized sexism, uh, you know, and, and, and so when you hear you say, hey, on Fox, Fox News, I hear it much more around sexism uh, than racism. That makes sense much to me. More. And it's acceptable uh, oftentimes by both men and perhaps uh, in different ways by women. Uh, I, I do think, I hope uh, that it's, you know, sometimes I think we, we know more about what we do want by knowing what we don't want. And uh, my, my hope is that this is putting a, a lens on that. I want to wrap up here. If someone has spent their life uh, as a outsider or an outlier, uh, whether it's I walk in both worlds, I'm maybe mixed race or I'm gay or I'm fill in the blank, right? I'm from another country, but I live in this country. 
Um, if somebody spent their life as an outsider or outlier and is really called to be a leader, uh, and uh, I believe many are, how would you coach one of those people who spent their life maybe not fitting? How would you coach them on increasing their turn on? Exactly as you almost described, meaning I've had a tough life being an outsider. I know what it's like to be outsider. I'm going to fight for you. I mean, Jeffrey, I think uh, as an LGBT person, as a gay baby boomer who grew up at a time where uh, there was less embrace of, of LGBTQ people, the fact that I went through that made me a more empathetic person for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I bet the same of you. Yeah. And I bet the same of anybody from a disenfranchised, oppressed community. And that's what I have advice to give. And that's, that's really the message to somebody who's been on the outside. I love it. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, where can we? So the book is Turn On. We can get it Amazon anywhere we look. Where else can Amazon we find it? Amazon or stephengoldstein.com, but Amazon has it. All yes. right. Fantastic. Uh, I know you're active on Twitter. Uh, we'll, I am. we'll put your uh, website, stephengoldstein.com, your Twitter handle, which is Stephen, but without an E at the St S T V. It's true. -N. It's true. Because you know why, Jeffrey? I never go by Steve. It's sort of a joke among my friends. So I could have chosen. Twitter, my name is one character too long for the Twitter handle, but I wouldn't go Steve Goldstein because that's not me. So I did S-T-V-E-N. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll place all that in the show notes. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time, for your education, for your service in this world. Uh, best of luck as you uh, continue in rabbinical school. And uh, I look forward to seeing what's next. Thank you. I'm really grateful to you for the work you do, too. Thank you so much. Hey there, thanks so much for listening in. If this conversation was powerful, if it stirred your soul or inspired your journey, then be sure to share it with a friend. Just copy and paste the link wherever you're listening to this podcast and text that link right now to a friend that you think would be inspired by this episode. And if this is your first time here, be sure to click that subscribe button over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a rating and review so I can get to know you and your thoughts better. To learn more about the work I do with emerging and established paradigm changers, go to thecourageousmessenger.com. That's all for today. Thanks so much for being here, and I hope to see you in the next episode.